afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. After a long cold winter, one of the joys of spring is seeing the reemergence of nature. All around us, the landscape is coming alive again. For a class at the University of Vermont, it's a perfect time to study outdoors with a focus on some of nature's least understood animals. Across the fences, Rebecca Gollin has our story. It's springtime in Vermont. Signs of life are emerging all around. Somebody find a garter somewhere? For these UVM students, that means that it's time to get up close and personal with their subject. She didn't have anything. She didn't even have food in there. I don't think she had a meal yet this year. It's spring. We've come from a long, cold, icy winter, snowy season. Um, and these animals are just starting to kind of, kind of wake up. Um, and uh, certainly right now it's pretty warm in the sun, which is nice for me, but super nice for, you know, a lot of the amphibians and reptiles. Seasonal inflows, the class is herpetology, and the students are spending this day Anything on a field trip in Rutland County. Maybe a like well, we cover the amphibians and reptiles of Vermont, so that's everything from the big green-faced frogs, like green frogs and bullfrogs, to the turtles, the painted turtles, snapping turtles, uh, spiny soft shells, and then into the snakes. Reptiles and amphibians are a great conservation vehicle because uh, students can handle them, they can see them, they can learn about them, and they don't migrate. They're right here, and if they're going to persist, it's because we're managing things right here. Count them. Professor Jim Andrews teaches a variety of herpetology and ornithology classes around the state. Time spent in the field, observing and learning about these animals in their natural habitat is invaluable. When you introduce people to the individual species and show them the habitat where they're found, they get a chance to handle them and interact with them. It's like being introduced to somebody in your neighborhood. It's the first step. Yeah, they're all like softball size. Yeah, okay. You know, these field trips where we really get to get out here and see the stuff, have just they're great learning experiences. And especially with the herps, on, unlike some of the other species, you get to handle them, which is big, because you can see it, you feel a connection towards it, and I think that's pretty cool. Taylor Swanson is a wildlife biology major at UVM. Yeah, I've been a little bit of a herp nut for a long time, since I was a little kid. He plans to pursue a career in the herpetology world. I just find them absolutely fascinating. They're so far beyond us as mammals in terms of their adaptations for living that it's just remarkable to study. I mean, between regenerative abilities in salamanders and scaled armor in snakes and their ability to travel without arms, it's just remarkable. And this species is... Ring neck. How do we know it's a ring neck snake? Ring on the neck. Oh, it's more. <laughs> <laughs> Nailed it. Didn't you? Along with identification and natural history of the various species, conservation is a major topic in class. Amphibians, in particular, because they have permeable skin, that means it's not as waterproof as our skin is, so they could take in whatever is dissolved in the water, whether it be rain whether it be these ponds, goes right through their skin into their blood. They don't have to eat it, they don't have any of that. It goes right through the skin into their blood. So, so anything in the air or in the environment ends up inside these creatures. In addition, many amphibians and reptiles have very specific habitat needs, spending part of their time in the water and part on land. Their range is often so small that an individual landowner could own land that encompasses the entire range of that individual or group of individuals. And whether or not they persist is entirely dependent upon our management on our land or our property or our yard or town forest or county. That's kind of a heat-loving snake. So if we can find this snake, we should be able to find other snakes. Although this is a sunny spring day, the weather is on the cool side. That means the students have to look extra hard to find some of these cold-blooded species. Where do you look for them? What are some of the techniques that you guys have learned? So here we're in kind of a diverse habitat. We've got some rock, slate rock piles, uh, as well as some like early successional forests uh, with a lot of coarse woody debris and rocks. 
So well, we're mainly looking really for snakes for under these slate slabs. Um, ring neck snake, common garter snake. There's a little pond right behind us uh, that could harbor some water snakes just emerging. Um, but I imagine you can find some more red back salamanders in the more wooded area over here. And, and there's peepers coursing in the back. Um, and I'm sure some frogs down by the pond side. Each find brings the students together to study the unique features of that animal. A lot of these species, like the spotted salamander I mentioned earlier, can live into their 20s. And I think that's really incredible. Um, and, you know, one female spotted salamander in the 20 years she lives produces thousands of eggs herself. What color is his upper lip? Yellow, pale. It's kind of pale, a pale yellow. Can I convince you of that? Yes. Pale yellowish green. It's not white. With the many individual characteristics of each of these species, Actually, even a lifelong uh, herp nut like there, Swanson so okay that, is learning basically. something new. I definitely found it very surprising that some of the amphibian species can freeze themselves. This is something I didn't know. I assumed it was impossible and, you know, very sci-fi out there. But uh, species like wood frogs and a couple others in the Pseudochrist family can draw the water out of their cells and then they'll freeze the water outside of the cells. And they'll effectively turn into a small ice cube and they don't have to burrow underground like a lot of the other species, which is very remarkable. Um, other species like turtles will overwinter on the bottom of the pond so they don't even need to come up for oxygen. They'll, they'll reconfigure their breathing methods like on spiny soft shells they'll, they'll change instead of breathing into their lungs they will have capillaries that fill inside their throat and it will actually pull the dissolved oxygen right out of it and they just kind of sit there on the bottom and overwinter. So stuff like that I, I just think is remarkable. The data the students are collecting will be entered into the Vermont Reptile and Amphibian Atlas, a project that Andrews coordinates. Anyone can contribute to the atlas, which helps to track numbers and distribution of species around the state. And so what might we expect to breed in here? Wood frogs. Wood frogs, definitely. Uh, I heard spotted salamanders from down that end. There's a world hidden just under the surface, and these UVM students are learning how to find it. In Castleton, I'm Rebecca Gollan with Across the Fence. Thank you, Rebecca. Our next segment involves a simple demonstration with soil. While the demonstration is simple, the issues it highlights are complex, involving erosion, water quality, and farming practices. To prove the point that good soil helps improve water quality and helps control erosion, Keith Silva caught up with soil specialists with the Natural Resources Conservation Service. It's going in a lot easier. Aaron Pratt and Sarah LaRose are soil conservationists with the National Resources Conservation Service in St. Albans. This is usually like the hardest sample to get um, because it doesn't hold together because there's no roots. Pratt and LaRose are looking for a soil sample to be used in a rainfall simulator. They're digging in this cornfield to find a good example of a common agricultural practice. So this is a sample from a cornfield that's been in corn continuously for 40 years. This sample will be used to show how much water runs off and infiltrates the soil when two inches of rain falls on it per hour. This is a rainfall simulator and the buckets uh, in front basically are going to show the runoff from the different types of uh, soil samples that we have here and the buckets in the back are going to show the infiltration rates to the different types of soils that we have. The sample from the cornfield goes alongside another similar example of exposed and aggressively tilled soil. There are also two other soil samples in this demonstration. Both of those examples represent ground that's received minimal tillage and has been managed using cover crops. Once the simulation starts and the water begins to soak in, or not, the results are obvious. It's such a good visual of where your soil is going when it's not covered that it might make them think twice about just uh, tilling everything up and leaving everything bare 
um, because the soil is basically what they need in order to make their crops. And if the soil keeps leaving their properties, then they're basically losing their own livelihood. The practice of growing the same crop on the same acreage year after year is known as monocropping. In addition to increasing the chance for erosion, monocropping also decreases soil health. Rotational grazing, growing different crops on the same acreage, increases soil health, promotes biodiversity, and keeps the ground covered to prevent erosion. This is a simulator that gives us that visual. It, it helps us understand what is going on in that rainstorm. It boils down those, those messages about cover, about diversity of different crops, about the importance of having um, roots in the soil, different and different roots, diversity of roots, all those, those really important things that make a, a healthy living soil. That is what we can see as we're, we're running this rainfall simulator. We can see the results of that and why we, it can help us keep our lake clean. It can help us have water in our soils for those drought times. You know, it, it, it really helps us both in terms of production on the farm, but then also in the, reducing those environmental impacts off of the farm. The greatest asset of every farm is its topsoil. It's in those top two to eight inches where a farmer's fortunes are won or lost. Impacts like planting and plowing, you know, farming, expose topsoil. So making sure those practices are properly managed goes a long way to improving soil health. What I'm trying to turn this into, it, it's going to look visually like chocolate cake. It's going to look so good you want to eat it. Eric Noel raises beef cattle on Health Hero Farm in South Hero. Noel is a longtime practitioner of soil conservation techniques like pasturing, crop rotation, and minimal tillage. I always look for root causes because you, you find a root cause of something, you fix that, and you take care of a lot of other problems around once you find the root cause. And I figured out that you fix the soil, you get the fertility up, and you get it so it's like chocolate cake and it'll infiltrate and you get increased forage volume, increased nutrient density in the forage, which goes to getting more feed into the cattle, more nutrient dense feed into the cattle, which increases their weight gain. So it goes to the bottom line of the beef production also. Noel and his family moved from a farm in Highgate to this farm in South Hero about a year and a half ago. When they started getting the land ready for production, Noel knew it was going to take something heroic to get the soil to meet his needs. This is our second growing season, and uh, last year what we started with was um, nutrients that were very low, especially phosphorus, which is energy into the plant. And over the course of two growing seasons, um, we've done some amendments and uh, some practices, and year on year we've increased the weight gain on cattle by 15 percent last year we were topping out about 1.7 pounds a day gain this year we're pretty close to two pounds a day gain on the cattle which is is what i want noel knows what he does with his soil goes beyond his farm gate and puts him on the same footing as his fellow vermonters no matter where you are you're in a watershed and when it rain falls it's going to end up someplace so it matters to everybody. It doesn't matter if you're a farmer, if you're a, a landowner, a developer, or somebody that lives in the city. It doesn't matter. If you've got land and water hits it and rain hits it, you need to be thinking about this stuff because the water is going to end up someplace. If you're not utilizing it and soaking it up where you are, it's going to run off for the most part because the, some, a lot of the practices we use right now with farming and development and roads and highways, they don't think about what the water's doing. This demonstration proves there's nothing muddy about this debate. There's no way to hide it. There's no way to say, well, that really isn't the issue. It's, it's very clear, it's crazy or not so clear. When it comes to the conservation of natural resources, everyone is on even ground. In South Hero, I'm Keith Silva with Across the Fence. Well, thanks, Keith, and thank you for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. I'll see you again next time on Across the Fence.